Hello, world. Look at me. I'm here again. Told you I would. Promised you. I threatened you. And here I am. Welcome to the fastest 30 minutes in television. Welcome to the Ken Simmons Show on uh, Area 58. I am Ken Simmons. I've got a very important guest here today, so I'm not going to take a lot of time in the monologue. I just want to let you know that I read the papers, and I'm going to report to you from time to time on anything good that happens. I don't see anything good happening. All this harassment, I'm getting sick of it. I'm getting tired of hearing about it. I feel sorry for the ladies involved, but I'm getting sick of it. You know, Congress, these guys are messing around, and we're paying for it. What kind of a deal is that? i got to go back. I said this before. You've heard it before, but I think it's apropos. I've got to say this. Mark Twain said it. Mark Twain said it. Politicians and diapers have to be changed often and for the same reason. I'll be right back with a very special guest. Don't go away. Okay, we're back, and glad to be. If it wasn't for you, there'd be no need for me. I am excited. I've got a very interesting guest. He's a, he's a friend of all of us, and uh, a lot of us, he's not so friendly, maybe. But that's the perils of that job. And we're going to talk to him at great length. We may extend the show because this guy is important. This guy is somebody you're going to want to hear. This guy is somebody that I want to hear. So take off your shoes, pour yourself your favorite beverage, whatever you're doing, stop. And I don't normally say that, but it's important that you listen to this guy and absorb and ask questions. You can call here with any questions. I'll see that he gets them, or the guys that work here will see that he gets them because I'm sure you're going to have some questions. Without further ado, I want to introduce to you the town administrator, Mr. Michael Malinowski. Michael. Ken, how are you? I'm good. Merry Christmas. Same to you. I, I have to ask you a question first before we start. Sure. How should I address you? Your Majesty, Your Excellency, <laughs> uh, Michael, uh, Mr. Malinowski? I think Michael works just fine. Michael works good, okay. Uh, but I've been called everything under the sun, I'm sure but I of prefer that. Michael. Remember, this is a family show. <laughs> He's, uh, you know, people, I, I, you hear all kinds of things about people in public service. Mm -hmm. Some people love you, mm -hmm. some people don't. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that comes as a shock, I guess. But it, Is it, it me or the job they don't love? That's a very good point. You, you know, uh, you've got one of the toughest jobs in the world. Not only you, but any town administrator, any mm -hmm. town manager, because you cannot be 100% right. And that must hurt a young guy like you with an ego like yours. You want to be 100% right, don't you? Not necessarily. No? No, because at the end of the day, you're working for what the majority of the public wants to see. So the public sets the policy, and you can never get 100% correctness because you're never going to please everybody all the time. So it's impossible to strive for 100% correctness because there's always going to be somebody that disagrees with what happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's going to be somebody that disagrees with the way you're doing it. Now, let me... Let me, see, let me just tell you this. This is, I think, is great. When he agreed to do the show because of the efficient guy he is that you've got for your town administrator, he sent over a list of topics that he would like to discuss. Now, normally I don't know, I do this. I like the, the surprise of not knowing what's going to happen. But in this case, we should know what's happening so he can give you actual, factual things without having a dig in his head. He's prepared for this. I am not, but I have in front of me, we could go on to the, at least the end of 2017 and well into 2018. So let's get started. The, the fiscal year 2019 budget process, can you elaborate on that? Sure, so uh, what I brought uh, along with me is the town financial policies. And these financial policies are a two-page document 
that were initially adopted by town meeting in 2014. And in essence, what that does is that sets up the parameters that the town and the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee have in essence directed us to do our work. Now, at the end of the day, I really don't make any decisions. I implement the policy the boards have adopted. And that's a, a, a unique distinction. So everybody, some people say, well, this is what he's doing, and he, and he, and he. It's not really me, first of all. It's the policy the town has adopted through the Board of Selectmen and or Finance Committee and or town meeting. And then it's our team that I have to spearhead to make sure implements those policies. And the one thing that I want to just, just call out in this that I think is, is really critical is that um, when I was hired by the town in the beginning of 2014, uh, we were having some significant financial issues in the town. And we had many buildings that were uh, needed some significant capital repairs or complete reconstruction. You know, I remember coming into the town and one of the initial objectives the town, uh, the selectmen gave me was, we have failed three times to build an elementary school and we need one. No one doubted the need that we needed a new elementary school because it was falling apart. But did we need a $67 million elementary school that would have taken up to three years to construct, including moving many of the children over to the middle high school to squeeze them in for a year while that building was being constructed? Wow, wow. And, and I say that because that's kind of how the town po financial policies, management policies came into play because there needed to be some strategic direction of what the town wanted to go in. And let me read this one part to you. And this is, this is really the essence of this whole two-page document. And it's in bold, and it's the financial objectives of the policies. It is the financial objective of the Board of Selectmen to demonstrate sound fiscal management of Carver's taxpayers resources through earning the highest bond rating that includes developing a sustainable, and again, sustainable, town-wide budget based on a 10-year forecast that provides the level of services we can afford within our known projected revenues. Now, there's a couple key points that are in there, is that it talks about bond rating. Now, the reason why bond rating is important is it's a third-party evaluation as to how your town management structure and financial structures run. If you get a good score, it's identical to a credit score. So as an individual, you and I have credit scores. If we have a low credit score, we may not be able to borrow. Or we may be able to borrow with high interest rates. If we have a high credit score, we can borrow with low credit rates, uh, interest rates. That saves us money. So by having the bond rating be high, it allows us to borrow low to pay for these capital improvements that we have to do. So that's one major aspect of is this. Is our bond rating high? Our bond rating is higher since I got here, and we have one more step that we're trying to get to, and um, I'm hopeful that we can get there next year, wow. which will be the highest step possible. Now, who sets the bond rating? Who, who's, is that a government, a federal thing? No, or? it's a, it's a uh, global organization. Um, there's two of them. Uh, the one we use is Standard & Poor's. And Standard & Poor's is, again, the independent, third-party, unbiased analysis of how an organization is run. It could be a private organization. It could be a public organization. It's what is the credit worthiness of that organization and their ability to pay. Again, if you pass those tests, you get a high rating. If they're not sure you're going to be able to pay, you get a low rating, so don't loan to them okay. that's down there. So that's, that's the bond rating piece. And again, the analogy that I, that I need to make is it's identical to a credit score. And our objective through this policy is to have a high bond rating so we can borrow low and allow us to do all of the work we need to do. Sure makes good sense to me. And it saves money. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'll give you an example with the elementary school. Oh, you, let me get one more question about the bond rating. Yep. Do you, as the town administrator, lobby for that? Do I lobby? I wouldn't use the word lobby. What I would use is I put together our team and... We then, um, with our financial advisor, meet with the rating agencies and document all of the things that we have done to demonstrate sound financial responsibility. Okay. So we, 
we have to present and they have to believe and not only believe in the management team and our ability, but also we got the data to back it up. So yes, we put together that process, but it's not really a lobbying. Uh, lobbying has a negative connotation. Yeah, I guess things. it does. Yeah. I'm looking at it as this is, this is our job to do and this is our direction and there's reasons why we do that. And then the other piece is part of these financial objectives is, and this is really what's important, is to provide the level of service we can afford based upon our known projected revenues. Our job is to provide services to the town, fire protection, police protection, education, whatever they may be, and our DPW and our EMS, which do a, do a fabulous job. The fact is that we all want the best services we can get, but we're also not a Wellesley. We're not a Duxbury. We don't have hundreds of millions of dollars of industry in the town that pays the taxes. So that's the yin and the yang of this is we, we want to have the best services we can have, but our pocketbook's only this big. Again, just like your own personal finances. Mm -hmm. If you're making X, it means you, and, and that X doesn't allow you to fit into your budget trips to Europe, you're not going to Europe. Yeah, you're right. I, I want a I want a Cadillac. Yes. I can't afford it. I'm driving a Ford. Well then Which is fine. Yep. And the Ford gets you from point A to point B. Absolutely. And as long as you maintain the Ford, it's a good investment. Absolutely. So it, it's identical to that and, and that's you know, what the job is, is that in essence we have directives like this, policy directives, and it's my job as the town administrator to pull our team together and make sure we implement these. The policy directive is written by you, though. The policy directive is written and voted by the Board of Selectmen. Oh, all right. Yes. Now, do I have guidance and do I have, make suggestions yeah. and do I try to use um, best models that are out there and all the institutional knowledge that I have to put together the be best package for them to deliberate on? Yes, I do. Uh, but at the end of the day, they make changes to this, and, and, and they may add things or delete things to this, which they always do. Once they vote on that, this then becomes their policy document that they're directing myself and the staff to implement. It's as simple as that. See, the, the, the town is a, is, thinks they know that you make all the decisions. You don't. You present. They make the decisions which you have to follow because they voted on it, whether you, are, whether you like it or not. Is it true, I've heard, is it true that you get up every morning before going to work, get down on your knees and pray. Where's this going? <laughs> and pray for the Board of Selectmen <laughs> to act in a proper way. Um, <laughs> well, for full disclosure, no, I don't get down on the okay. knees and pray every morning. So, I'm, only kidding. I'm only kidding. No, I thought we just ought to lighten it up just yeah, a little bit. But, but. but, you know, it is important that you do have a board um, that can communicate with each other, collaborate with each other. And, again, I'm yeah. talking to the board right now. Yeah. Listen to others' points of, of view. Listen to the, yeah. to the facts that are known. Take all that in and then make an objective decision. Yeah. And I will tell you, um, the board we have right now does a phenomenal job with doing that, even the last board we have. Yeah. And, and it's not always five to zero votes. There's a lot of times it's four to one, sometimes three to two. Sometimes the votes go the other way. And yeah. there have been many times where I've made recommendations and they voted against that. But again, I don't make the decision. I make the recommendation. They make the vote. Can I ag say I agree with you? I think this board is great. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great board. I think they have differences of opinion, which is great. I would hate it if they all agreed every time. Oh, so would I. I think it's a great board. I think I've, I'm a newcomer, fairly newcomer to this town, 16 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a great little town. Mm -hmm. I think it's prestige. It's got, got a lot of industry, as you pointed out. But look what we're achieving. I think in large part because of guys like you, where the school is going up, a new police station, the fire station, the library, the town hall. Mm -hmm. This town, and, the, and this new lighting on the street. I think this town is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we're affording it. <laughs> Can you explain that? And I'll go over that, but I want to make two points. So right. One is that, um, that, you know, to some extent I become the figurehead, yeah. but I don't do everything. 
and I have a team around me that does tremendous work, and it allows us to have the ability of accomplishing an awful lot with few people. So although I may help guide, steer, and help direct things, at the same time, they're the ones that are also giving me input to make some changes in our path as we go along, and, and it really is a team effort. Just like on the Board of Selectmen, the last thing somebody in my position should ever want is a board that always votes five to zero with whatever they want. Yeah. Now, I, there are some people in my profession that like that because then life's easy. Yeah. But you know what? That's only a temporary easement, easiness because at some point something's going to get missed because you're not analyzing everything you're doing. It's good to have discussion. It's good to have transparency. It's good to air everything out on public, you know, yeah. TV yeah. or in public meetings because yeah. collectively many heads can come up with a better solution than one and I firmly believe that in whether it's the Board of Selectmen or whether it's our management team or our overall town team of people that deliver the services that's what makes the town work. No question about it. No question about it. You know just to divert the subject in mm -hmm. just a little bit here uh, last year mm -hmm. uh, the town of Carver turned out at the polls at an 8%. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you want to take that to, and simplify it a little bit, let's assume there were 100 eligible voters in Carver. 8% means that eight of them voted. 92 didn't. Now, those eight people that voted get to run the town. You don't because you didn't vote. And then I see people say, my vote doesn't count. Of course it counts. You know, there's, been, there's been subjects in other TV shows I've done in other towns where some people have said, I want to select and say, all people shouldn't vote. Everybody says, everybody should vote. No, all people shouldn't vote. Only the ones with intelligence should vote. Uh, who, who determines the intelligence? Where, where do you get that from? And I, another town said, we should have, we should hire voters. Professional voters. Imagine that. The Constitution guarantees us the right to select our leaders. And you people, even though we've made it easy for you, we've got early voting now. We vote on Saturdays when presumably most of you have the day off. It's a great time to come up and meet your fellow citizens that you haven't seen for a long time. And the most important part is you're selecting the leaders for the next two, three, four, five years, whatever it is. Oh, that makes me so upset. That and the fact that we vote for a guy who's unopposed. If there's a guy running unopposed, somebody should get up just to give him some opposition, just to let him to know what he's running for is damned important in this town. I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with your premise that everyone should use their constitutional right and yeah. participate yeah. Um, either, whether it's voting or whether it's town meeting. And one of the things that I've, I've learned is that um, in today's age, you have people that are dual income families, they're, they're working, you know, commuting an hour eat before each day, they've got to take care of the kids, and they don't have a lot of time. And what we have tried to do since uh, my arrival with the Board of Selectmen is try to focus on having only one annual town meeting a year. And we try to get it in one night. And now, again, two years ago, we had a special town meeting, but that was for the new elementary school. But other than that, everything's been done on one annual town meeting with the objective of getting it done in one night, and we combined some articles to make sure it's there. Because I believe in today's age, we have to respect people's time, just as we want them to respect the government and come to participate in town meeting once a year. So, um, you know, I, I wish every resident would come to town meeting. Um, but I realize people have careers, jobs, families, and other interests, um, interests that they have to take care of. But again, we want everyone to come. And we're trying to respect people's time, getting it done in one night. And then we, we prepare an elaborate um, town meeting packet that goes out that really goes through and describes each article because it is important that when you're presenting to the, to the taxpayers, that they're not, they don't have time to come to every meeting. 
So when you're at town meeting, you have to present the plan, the logistics, the logic, why you're doing it, so they can have the, the, the pros and the cons, and then hopefully make the decision that's best for the town, whatever that is, but making sure that they're educated, and that's why we put that package together. So I, I like people to come to town meeting. I like people to attend our meetings. The more input, the better. Uh, we're always trying to get more people on committees, and we have many committees that are understaffed right now. So. Um, I believe it's important to um, to get involved. I will s go off. I will talk about myself for a second. Here is in the town that I live in, um, and, and this goes back ten years ago. Um, you know, going around with little league and soccer games, and I'd have somebody on the field, you know, parent friend of mine that would just and this happened more than once, and they come up and they'd be complaining about this with the town and that with the town and that with the town, and and I and again friends of mine, I'd say, well, okay, I, I hear your point. Um, have you ever gone to a selectman's meeting? No. Okay. Um, have you ever watched a selectman's meeting on cable TV? No. Um, you ever read the minutes of a selectman's meeting? No. Okay. Um, you must have gone to town meeting and heard all this discussed. <laughs> no, never been there either. <laughs> I said, okay. This conversation's en ended because you're not involved, so you can't, you've lost the right to complain. Again, this is me talking to a friend of mine. Absolutely. You've lost the right to complain Absolutely. because you haven't done your constitutional right. Want to go and get a beer? We'll grab a beer and we'll talk about baseball, <laughs> but we're not going to talk about town politics Absolutely. anymore because you're complaining without doing, without trying to at least be part of a solution. Yeah. Yep. And, and again, I'm not speaking about Carver. I'm speaking about my town in that, that scenario, but I, I do believe it is important for people to participate. Yep, I was a town meeting member in the town of Randolph, I'll mm -hmm. say it. That's what town I was born and brought up in. Mm -hmm. And people, like you say, they want to talk about this and want to talk about that. They don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea because they're not involved. Right. I want to ask you a stupid question, all right? I got, I'm full of stupid questions. <laughs> I, uh, before a town meeting, like maybe a month before, two weeks before, three weeks, whatever you, whatever you think is possible, uh, you send us an email mm -hmm. about what you want to discuss today. Could, is it possible to send every town, every member of the town, an email about what's going to happen at town meeting so they can think about it before so, they get there? So we do. You do? We do put notice out there. We do provide the information. We don't send email because we don't have every resident's email, and not every resident has an email. But what we do do is we do post the entire warrant with all of the budget summaries online on our website, and that is available, and it is disseminated to all the boards and commissions in the town. Anyone that's a stakeholder, part of a committee or board, because we have those emails, we do forward it to those people that's there. And, and, you know, here's another change for transparency, because I think, you know, from what I've heard, the town is significantly more transparent, and, and I don't really know how much more transparent we can get. I think we, we're, we're doing as, as much as humanly possible so with I. the staff we have, is that in years past, um, prior to my arrival, the budgets were set by, like, a, a side meeting 30 minutes before town meeting as to what the budgets were going to be. So how, do you, how does the citizen have a chance to understand and review that ahead of time when it's done in a, in a quick little meeting before the, the main town meeting? So what, uh, one of the things that um, I asked the selectmen to create when I first got here was to create a governance committee. And the governance committee was to really kind of look at the governance structure of the town. And I had some suggestions, and they implemented some of those. They modified others, and they created some of their own. But one of them that came through was we made a, a bylaw change that the Board of Selectmen have to vote the f any financial articles 30 days prior to town meeting. No more 30 minutes, three minutes, great. it's 30 That's days. That's great. That's great. And once those, that happens, it's out there, you know, for the public to review. And, and we have a, a budget, a four-step budget process for both capital outlay in, the budget, in, our, in our operating budget. And just real quickly, it's four steps. The first step is where the town administrator and uh, my financial team um, go out and kind of look at what our forecast is going to be, what our revenue is going to be, and we try to understand how that's going to play out. We then bring that to the selectmen. They then approve that as this is what our for, uh, revenue is going to be for the next fiscal year. Go forward and build your budgets on that. Then we have the department heads create the budgets. 
Then I present a balanced budget, because we have to balance our budget, not like the federal government, the town has to balance its budget. We present that to the Board of Selectmen and the FinCom. The Finance Committee then goes and does you know, their public meetings and reviews and everything. And then after that, then um, by March 6th, because we're going to have our meet annual town meeting this year on April 10th, March 6th, the budget will be voted. Annual town meeting is April 10th. But again, it's a logical four-step process that's that we great. go through. That's great. I had no idea that that's the way you did it. I thought they were still making it 30 minutes before the town meeting started. No. no. Nope. We make sure it's done well ahead of time. No, that's great. Uh, how long have you been town administrator now? Since 19, 2014? 2014, yes. Three, three years? Well, before next month. So, it, it seems like you've been here forever. Oh, I love this town. Yeah? Where do you live? Do you mind if I ask Sure. That? I live in the town of Cohasset. Cohasset. Mm -hmm. So it's about a 45-minute commute from here. Wow. Reverse commute. So the good thing is I don't hit much traffic. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's great. There's a, um, a family in Cohasset by the name of Magner. You know him? I don't think okay. I do. Is that where the uh, music circus is? Or yes, the, it is. Yeah. Um, um, I have a house that was built in 1790. Oh, geez. And I've spent the last... Um, 15 years, gutting it down to its original post and beam, and did 90% of the work myself, and have rebuilt the whole thing with my, my, my wife and I. Oh, that's great. That's great. You enjoy the job? I love the job. Yeah. I got good people here. Were you a town manager or a town administrator in another town prior to this? Sure. So I have been town manager before. I've also been executive director of redevelopment authorities. I've also... I uh, worked on military base conversions, um, and I've also done some, some work in the private sector, too. Wow. But uh, I, I will say is that w we, this, this position can be really fun and, and stimulating when you have everybody working towards a common goal. And in this town, we do. And it starts with the financial policies that town meeting the Board of Selectmen have adopted. And, and they had a direction as to where they wanted to take the town. And with them and with our, our department heads and our staff, everybody's rolling in the same direction. And, and that's unheard of a lot in, yeah. in local government. And, and, I, and I will put our town up compared to any other town in this state that in the last four years, we have, we have transformed our management and organizational structure, built a lot of things that you said, all of it within the tax base, but for the elementary school. Watch the town, uh, the the voters approved it going for a dollar thirty-two per thousand in value, and we've got it down to seventy-nine cents per value. So you know, I think we're doing very well. With that, I'm going to take a short break. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with a Michael Malinowski show. Okay, we're back. We're refreshed, and we're ready to go again. I, uh, this is an extended uh, show uh, because of its importance, um, and we're, we're going to do something a little more on this later in the year when the new year comes, uh, before election time, so that you'll have some information at your fingertips if you watch this show, if you uh, attend uh, Area 58 meetings. Uh, we'll be more than happy to help you with it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, say one thing before we start again with Michael. Um, it's my, my experience that when you're interviewing, and remember I've been doing this for about 40 years off and on, uh, not community access, but commercial. When you're going to meet somebody important, in, in my opinion, the town administrator is very important, so are the selectmen. And so are the other department heads. But you, you're kind of intimidated until you meet them and understand that they're real people trying to do a real job. They're not what you might think they are sitting at home hearing about them. And that's my experience with uh, Michael Malinowski. He's a hell of a nice guy. And he's certainly full of information. And he's got the best interests of this town at heart. Michael, let's go back to that 79 cent tax thing. Is that, um, again, I'm going, to, I'm going to come out with the, uh, the new school, mm -hmm. which is looking gorgeous. 
the fire station, which I've interviewed the chief, and that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, there's going to be a new fire station, and we've got the, be the most beautiful library in the Commonwealth. We've got the most beautiful town hall in the Commonwealth, in my opinion. How, how, how much is my tax rate going to go up? Can you, can you, sure. is, that in, is that at your fingertips? No, it is, it right. is. And, and um, let me start by saying um, taxes generally, you know, year over year, go up 2.5% plus new growth in the town. And that's the state law. That's really what the state has developed so you have Prop 2.5. So every year there's always an inflation factor, of, and it's usually like 2.8%. The taxes go up across the board. Some go higher or lower based upon the valuation of their house and the market conditions, but the town as a whole goes up about 2.8%. So I'm, I'm putting that out there because there's a baseline that just happens year over year over year over year, and that's state law. Now, everything we're talking about is built into our financial management policies and are built within the existing tax base people are paying, with the exception of the new elementary school. The new elementary school was done as a debt exclusion, which m means that for the period of time that it takes to pay off the school, the community pays a higher tax rate for those 25 years. When the bond payments are done, the tax, taxes drop down to what their normal level would be. And as I said it, 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 earlier, is the, the uh, town meeting authorized us to borrow X. We ended up borrowing Y, which means they pay Y. They're paying less than what they authorize us to do. And you know, that happened again through, through the hard work of good policy from the Board of Selectmen and, and a great team that put that together. And that was actually, that team included the school building committee. And just to rewind real quickly is the original project, again, was a $67 million renovation project, three years to construct, move the kids to the high school, some of the kids to the high school, while the building was being constructed. You'd have yeah. little kids in the high school. Yeah. Not necessarily yeah. a good thing. Yeah. And through the efforts of the elementary school building committee, um, which the selectmen authorized me to appoint the members, and when I did that, is, uh, it was as diversified a group of people as you can get. <laughs> and, you know, we had a pro-school and anti-school, a liberal, a conservative, <laughs> someone with construction experience, someone with, um, you know, education experience. And we put all that together. And the beauty there was that at the end of the day, through a lot of hard work, the committee unanimously agreed on a solution. And that solution is what eventually went to tell me. Now, there was a lot of work in between there because we had to go back and redesign the project. But here's what I can tell you, is that the project came in at $50 million, not $67 million. Wow, that's nice. And it may even be a little less than that because right now a normal project has about a 3 to 5% contingency that it's used. We've used half a percent of our contingency. And you use most of the contingency in the beginning of the project and we're 60% of the way done the project. Oh, that's cool. So that actually, there may be some more good news coming out of that. Um, second is it meet all of the educational requirements. Nothing has been sacrificed for the education component. Third, one of my strong pieces that I, that I make sure with any building, is it durable? Is it gonna last beyond its extended lifetime? We don't skip on durability. We make sure we're putting quality material in there that's going to last a long time. And we believe this building's been designed to last a long time. So it's going to continue to come in under budget, meets the education requirement, and is extremely durable. It's a great, great project. And here's the real kicker is um, we're getting money through the State um, Building Authority, MSBA, Mass School Building Authority. And they, uh, you know, they got to spread the money around the state. And when we did our project, they said the most we'll pay at that period of time, because they changed every couple of years, they increased yeah. the number, was $299 a square foot. In the last decade, 15 years, no project, elementary school project, ever came in on budget 
Most of them are 5, 10, 20 percent above that number. Ours is the first one. Really? Come in at that number. Oh, gee. At that number. <laughs> what do you owe that to? Is that because of who oversees that? Is that something that uh, well, has to be overseen? Or somebody that sure. pushing the buttons? Or so, Simon Legree? Or? <laughs> Um, again, I'll go back to the team effort, um, but the selectmen have appointed me as the quarterback okay. to oversee all construction projects. Actually, okay. town meeting has appointed me to be the quarterback on all construction projects. So if they fail, it's my fault. If they succeed, it's everybody's success. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> That hurts. That hurts. <laughs> and uh, No, not at all. Not uh, at all, because okay. that, that's what my job is. All right. Um, but really it comes down to is the committee objectively looked at it. There were, there were some people that wanted these you know, very expensive things that didn't have a high education component that weren't going to really change anything, but because somebody else had it, we should have it. But in reality, it really wasn't worth the money. So the committee says, well, no, that hasn't been justified to spend our limited resources, you know, go back to our financial policies, you know, um, to... Um, services we can afford within our known projected revenue. So if our re revenues are X, then how can we afford Y yeah. when we don't have that? Absolutely. So again, it was a real team effort. Uh, we put that together. Now, here's where the real thing comes into play, is that we hire a, um, so we had the committee, and then under that I, I have a now technical review committee that meets weekly. It's uh, Scott Neef, myself, Ruby Maestas, who's the, the principal, um, uh, Bill Harriman I, is the chairman of that committee. Uh, John Deli Piscoli is on there, and Dave Siegenthoff. So the six of us meet on a weekly basis with our project manager, uh, PMA. And, and I will tell you, they are do a phenomenal job in overseeing the project because they're our technical experts. They manage the project on an hour-to-hour -hour basis for us. They're contract, they're construction people, so they know the insides and outs of the field. They're overseeing the contractor. Free? Oh, no, we pay for them. It's okay. a significant cost, okay. but it saves us so much money because we're not getting change orders. We're fighting back with the contractor where they submit things that normally most towns say, okay, fine, we'll just sign off on that, we'll sign off on that, we'll sign off on that. I don't want to say most towns. Most building committees do that. Yeah. We're like, no, prove that it's a justifiable cost. Was there something that changed in the conditions of the site? then we'll pay for it. We pay for anything that we're obligated to pay for, but if it's the contractor's error, then they own that. And these people help. So my point is, is there's many layers to this team that have put this together to bring this project forward. But all the other capital projects, whether it's the new fire station, we just committed, uh, completed a multi-million dollar renovation of the middle high school, uh, brand new roof, New boilers, energy efficient boilers, all new doors and windows, that was just completed, all within the tax base. Um, we're talking about doing a, a COA facility. We're talking about doing a new um, a police station uh, and a uh, sports complex at the middle high school. All of that will be within this financial plan that without boggles, going that, back to the town. Michael, that boggles my mind. All that, all that that you're doing is still within the tax base. Still within the tax base. The town I live in just wanted to borrow $300,000 to do a study, and they had to borrow it because it's not built into a plan. My word. We, we, we can come up with the money to do it within our tax base. My God, that's incredible. That's really incredible. Mm -hmm. I'm very, when is the uh, finish date for the new school? When so the new school will be completed in June, June. and um, we'll have a week to move out um, some of the supplies out of the old school and then it'll start to be uh, remediated and then demolished. And the fields will be constructed in the fall, and the fields will be operational the year later. Oh. But the new school will be up and running. I mean, technically the new school will be done in June, but we don't start until September. September, yeah. Um, and the new school will be done, so we can tear down the old ones. So you'll be working out of the new school? That's correct. Is there a date set for the beginning of the police station? So the police station um, is going through, um, the chief is doing a strategic plan um, and, and for his department. What is the police needs going to be in 10, 25, 50, 75 years from yeah. now? Yeah. That study is already ongoing. Um, it should be completed by the end of this month. Um, we did have a public meeting where I invited 75 stakeholders in the community. 
uh, to come to the meeting and share their thoughts on the police agency, the police department. Once you have that defined, then you can then develop what the space needs are going to be. Once you have the space needs, then you build a building around the space needs. So it's a logical process that we're going through. What's the future vision? What are the space needs for the future vision? Now let's build a building on that. To answer your question on when, my goal, um, and, and this is aggressive, and unfortunately I get, I get I, I'm, I'm somewhat aggressive on timetables many times, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try, um, is to bring uh, a funding package to town meeting uh, in April to fund the new um, uh, police station. Um, and uh, from there, then we'll move forward with doing the design. Um, and, and I do not think it's unrealistic that you could have a groundbreaking uh, in 2019. Wow. Wow. Great. I hope I'm around to see that. Because mm -hmm. th the, the old fire station, of it, will that come down? Uh, I can't answer any of that because we don't know. Okay. And, and that's right. part Fair of enough. the analysis that we have to do is do we tear that down in that location? Do we move it to another location? Do we have one, two buildings? Uh, you know, this is part of what do we need first, is space for the, for the officers and the detectives and everything. Yeah. Then let's figure out where the best location is and what the best configuration is. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm very, uh, I want people to, uh, to uh, first to walk through in a logical manner versus making decisions and then have to try to design to that thing and that costs money. Yeah. And if you build it, it's the cheapest way of doing it, which yeah. is what we're doing. I like the way you talk. I really do. Yeah. I like the way you talk. I, uh, we've only got a limited time here, sure. so why don't we go down this list? Yeah, let me, let me hit a couple things here. Yeah. Um, you know, I've talked about our financial plans. I'm going to just go over these quickly. This is our 10-year our forecast that we have that's presented every year at town meeting. This is in our town meeting packet. And this just kind of shows what the projected revenue is going to be for the town in the future. And, and, and this year we, we have about 2.1% uh, uh, of money to spend within the school and the town. So with that, the school has a budget, an operational budget of $22.259 million, and the town has $9.8 million. And that's what we have to run the town side, and the school has to run their piece. And, and that's all set in stone. Our concern is that our growth is projected to be under 2% per year. And you know when you have health care going up 8, 10, 12 percent per yeah, year, yeah. those numbers just don't work. Right. So we're always trying to figure out how we get more efficiencies in our government, um, which we've made a lot of strides for, um, or we look at um, how to generate more revenue. You know, from an efficiency standpoint, from an organizational standpoint, um, for the last couple of years, we've completely reorganized our, our town departments. We've consolidated three finance departments into one, and now we have a finance director. We've consolidated um, you know, four or five permitting offices into one. And many of those were operated by part-time people. So when they went on vacation for two weeks, the door went down and that office was closed for two weeks. Yeah. Now, if you're a contractor and you're trying to do something, you need an inspection, that's not good, that's not good customer not service. Good. Not good. So again, these are organizational things that we've done. And our last two that, that were, are, are currently being implemented is where we've uh, partnered with the school. And with that, um, we have partnered with the school to develop a town-wide IT department. And we've hired a director for the entire department. His name is Stephen Mahoney. And he's overseeing all of the technology in the town. So any computer printer that's ever purchased has to have his signature on it. It has to be intertwined with our network. He oversees that. So if something goes down in the school, he fixes it. Something goes down in the town hall, he fixes it. And, and with, he has some people working for him, too, so it's not just him. But now, all of a sudden, we're, we're looking at, just like as the roads are maintained in the town, the computer network, we're treating just like a road where it's a town-wide infrastructure piece. Whether your school or town, it's one piece, and we manage it together. We're doing the same thing uh, as it relates to our operations and maintenance department, what used to be the town buildings and grounds, the town DPW, and the school facilities department and the school's turf uh, field management group. We've, in essence, taken those four groups within school and town and have merged those all into one. 
Wow. And we have Dave Siegenthoff is our director and John Woods is the uh, deputy director. The two of them partner to run all of the infrastructure in the town. And Jeez. we've consolidated all of our water treatment facilities under their control as well for the management structure of those. So this is how we're able to reorganize government that some of these moves don't necessarily save money, but when you consolidate these departments, you become more efficient and yeah. you can do more with less. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what's yeah. helping us do a lot more than we had before. So yeah. whether it's the private sector or the public sector, you know, we're really trying to figure out what is the best organizational structure for the next 10, 20, 50 years, and we can't run things like they did, you know, 100 years ago. You know, 100 years ago, you used to elect a treasurer collector. Now, there's so much education and requirements you need, you need to appoint someone who's qualified that has the certifications versus someone that's going to learn on the job and try to pay bills for $40 million. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a different era we're living in right now. That's for damn sure. Right. Yeah. So we got that, um, I guess, a couple other things. Then we have Can our... Can I ask you a question before sure. you... What would you think, maybe the town isn't big enough yet, but mm -hmm. what would you think about a town council instead of selectmen and so forth? We just did that in Randolph. Yeah. Um, there's pros that, and cons. That's water he's drinking, by the way. We had it checked out by our <laughs> chemist. As he, he went left makeup, they took a breath of sample, so he's okay. <laughs> he's okay. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's, there's pros and cons of each one of them. Um, and at some point, uh, towns become too big that you do need to have um, key involvement where you have people that are involved on a, on a weekly basis that understand what's going on yeah. so they can make more informed decisions. Yeah. Um, so you do see some of the larger towns heading in there. I think the town of Franklin does a great job with a, with a town council. Um, I'm not sure that that's kind of the direction Carver is, needs to look at in the near future. Uh, and I'm not saying 50 years from now you wouldn't yeah. go in that direction. Yeah. Uh, but in essence, a, for the audience, a, a town council acts as the board of selectmen. They're elected by wards. You can have anywhere from 7 to, to 11 members. And, and in essence, they, they act as the town meeting, so you don't have to have town meetings in the future. Yeah. Um, you know, probably another way of looking at it is they're equivalent to a city council. They have that legislative, they're the legislative body. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's representative. Um, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, right now we do have a decent uh, turnout for town meeting. But to your earlier point, if it all of a sudden turns out that we're not getting quorums at town meeting, there's not enough people oh, coming. That worries me. Then, then at that point, you have no choice but to go into that direction. Or town meeting members. Or town meeting members. Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right, I don't want to waste any more sure. time on that. Let's yeah, so a couple other things. I mean, you, you, this goes to our capital plan. And, um, and, and again, with the organizational structure, whether it's public or private, you always have to relook at your organization and figure out what changes boy. you need to make to make things happen. Boy, oh, boy. As it relates to our capital plan, and this is something that uh, we took some earlier ideas and built them into this more elaborate capital and debt um, stabilization plan. And what we do is all of our debt is paid out of this plan, plus any direct purchases that we have for equipment is paid out of here. And that allows us to always have a consistent capital plan going forward. So we don't have peaks and valleys and it allows for us to maintain our infrastructure better. And with all the investment the town's doing right now, it, the selectmen felt there's a direct obligation that as we build it, we have to guarantee we can maintain it. And that's why we have the Operation and Maintenance Department. That's also another reason why we have this, this plan here. So all of our debt is built into this plan plus all of our capital projects. So for instance, this year, we have $2.9 million in our capital and debt stabilization plan. Now, with debt and some leases and some other fixed costs, uh, that only leaves about $720,000 to pay for cash for stuff, which, you know, we're buying a new front-end loader, we're replacing some of the exterior town hall, we're, we're buying some buses. Uh, this includes our town-wide technology, but it's all built into the plan. And this plan now allows us to forecast um, for a council and aging addition. 
and you know here's just one scenario that we're looking at and our committee is going to be going over this is whether we put an addition on the back of the library we've had members from the coa board of directors go out and poll their members and determine what the need is again going back to the police station what is the need once you determine the need then you can define your space to satisfy that need once you have your space then you can build a building or an addition around that we're doing that with um, what we're calling the carver community center library slash coa complex and again this is not set in stone this is just one idea to start the process and um, and it shows you know we need a kitchen and we need some additional dining facilities <laughs> we're doing very similar thing here with the middle high school we had a meeting last night to look at redoing the sports complex look at the that. track that we have going around the facility is in disrepair it it's beyond its useful life it needs to be dug up and redone in addition to that, the way the football field was designed, it does not drain properly. And uh, from the 30-yard line down, um, after rain, you've got the ducks and the geese, you know, all sitting in there. And this is, you know, again, on the 25-yard line. <laughs> Could so, this be a CPA project? Yes, this, this would be a CPA project. So here again, we have a diverse committee, uh, Scott Neef and myself, Dave Sigentoff, um, We've got uh, Gary Garretson on there, uh, Mary Ross. Um, and I think I'm missing somebody. Oh, yes, um, Andrew Sotawali from the school committee. So we've got a diverse group that's yeah. looking at this yeah. and saying, okay, we know education wants this, but again, here's our budget. Let's figure out how we can accomplish both goals. And um, we're having a meeting in two weeks, and, you know, we're making some progress on it. So those are how some of our projects are getting done, all fitting within that budget process. Boy, oh boy, have you, ever, have you ever listened to a more articulate guy make a dry subject sound interesting? <laughs> i got to compliment you. you. You are extraordinary. What you said today, I could be falling asleep if I weren't on camera. You made it interesting. I'm, I'm excited. Well, it is exciting. And, and I think that uh, I'll go back to we've got a great board of selectmen we've got yes. a great management team that helps put this all together and um, and it is exciting and um, you know I, in my spare time when I'm not having enough fun with the town of Carver I do a little bit of this on the private side too <laughs> and have some fun doing some organizational stuff for some business structures. Uh, you open the door yeah I'm, but I'm not gonna pursue it um, I've been asked by four or five people in the town sure the article in the Carver Reporter some mm -hmm. time ago I've still got the copy yep. about the conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, on investigation and talking to several people who are in the know, it really is not. It really is not. You are guaranteed that you could work a Saturday by the Board of Selectmen before you took the job. Yep. And you were doing it. You are working with Mr. Della Piscoli. Yep. And uh, I think that he has in his in a way, the best interests of the town at heart. Mm -hmm. uh, although some people are opposed to his actions, mm -hmm. but the heck with all that. W I, the town is going so smoothly. That school is being built with so little inconvenience. It's right on the main street, you know. Mm -hmm. And I go up and down 58 all the time, and I have not been held up by it. The only thing I'm held up by is uh, people wanting to go in and drop out their kids. Right. That's a little problem. But other than that, everything that you're, that's being done here, I was going to say that you're doing here, you're not, but you're overseeing it, and it's the same thing, it runs very smoothly. Uh, that fire station is a miracle. I think it's a miracle. And a lot of people say, what do we need that for? I said to the chief, why do you need bedrooms for the guys? They're all local. They live... He said, when they come off a fire, with a really bad fire, they need to get showered, they need to get some sleep, they need to get some rest. Makes sense to me. Yep. And we've got it for the next, what, 50, 60 years? Mm -hmm. I just so glad that I live in this town. You want to say something? Well, you know, you, you brought up the issue of the conflict of interest, and certainly oh. I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize my career or my reputation. And um, yes, you're correct. It was written in my contract that I can do outside consulting. And whether I take vacation or I work on nights, I mean, people do what they do. And um, I, I ran that by the Board of Selectmen. Again, it's in the contract. 
From there, we ran it by town council. From there, we ran it to the State Ethics Commission and made sure that... You did that go as far as the State Ethics oh, Commission? Oh, absolutely. We had documents written from the State Ethics Commission because, in essence, John Deli owns more than just the property in the town of Carver. His, where I work for is his holding company, his management company, that oversees the two railroads that he, that he operates. I, 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 right. was, I bought right. three locomotives last week. All right. All right. Yep. Now, you, you open the door again. Sure. Why is it not a conflict of interest if you control the, all the property in the town of Carver, for the town of Carver, mm -hmm. and now you control all the property for Mr. Della Piscoli? Mm -hmm. Why is that not a conflict? Well, because I don't control anything in the town of Carver. You're the president of his corporation. Oh, well, no, no for John's stuff, now that's different for um, the property that he owns, but you asked about the town of Carver. I'm I don't control... talking about the both, both of them. Yeah, so in the town of Carver, I don't control anything. The planning board does all the permitting. The Conservation Commission does all the permitting. Um, that's where the permitting processes go through. So I don't have any direct involvement in that, and I make sure that I recuse myself from all of that. And there have been a few com uh, processes with the Board of Selectmen where they approved a common victor's license. And again, I put for full disclosure, I'm not involved in that. So I don't get involved in any of his business within the town of Carver as it relates to the town of Carver. What I do is, just like I've done for the town of Carver, with the reorganization and the management structures and the financial things, Structure that's system. what I help him with on his business. Go, go back just a, just a bit. Sure. You, you, you recuse yourself from this, you recuse yourself from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do we know that? All due respect, mm -hmm. how do we know that? How do you know that? Well, if there was ever an incident that you felt that I didn't, you'd bring it up. I'm bringing it up. Okay, what incident have I not recused myself on? Oh, I'm not going to specify anything. Okay. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, yeah, because I, there I, is none. That's the, the okay. Yeah, well. The, okay. Yeah. Great. Great. I'm glad of that. Right. But I've uh, developed a fondness for you in the mm -hmm. last thirty minutes that I didn't expect to. Mm -hmm. And I like what you're doing, and I don't want to see you go. Mm -hmm. I want you to do what you're doing. <laughs> I, well, uh, I don't intend to go. I, I think okay. um, you know. I really enjoy working for the town of Carver. I can I tell I really that. enjoy working for the people that are here. Um, I do like the extra mental stimulation of doing something for Mr. Deli on the side. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I enjoy both. Okay. I, uh, I, I'm not going to say anything anymore than okay. that, except that you have been a very wonderful guest. I hope you will come on again with me sometime, mm -hmm. and we can discuss other town matters. Uh, and put it before the people mm -hmm. where it belongs. And uh, I don't know what else to say except you people, if you've got any questions that, that uh, may derive from this conversation, uh, the number here is 508-866-1019. Uh, whoever you talk to will take down the message and I will answer it. If I can't answer it, I know who can. That's right. And uh, he's certainly willing to do that. But I think, I think, I know, I'm glad that I live in Kava. <clears throat> I'm glad that we've got the Board of Selectmen we've got. I'm glad that we've got the town administrator we've got. Because these people are no-nonsense people, but they're nice people. They've got the interests of the town at heart. Because everything they do reflects on them. Everything they don't do reflects on them as well. And I think they're doing one hell of a job, if you'll forgive my language. I just wanted to be emphatic. I think we are very lucky to live in a town like this where they can have these magnificent buildings go up and miracle of miracles, because there is a God, is still within the tax base. That, I think, is incredible. I want to wish you and yours a Merry Christmas. And same to you. And I want to thank you so much for coming here and giving my show a little class. <laughs> I want to thank Rich Goulart, the executive director here, also the cameraman for today. Thank you, Rich. Chris Gardner, a young, good-looking guy who does a hell of a good job. Thank you, Chris, for being here. Merry Christmas to both of you guys. I'll see you later because i got to collect my paycheck. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye now. And again, I thank Mr. Michael Melanowski, our town administrator. Give him the respect he deserves and give him a little nudge every once in a while, <laughs> too, just to keep him on the ball. Keep a saw in your heart. Goodbye, and God bless. Till next time. Mm -hmm.